So our last speaker, Dr. Jose Diaz Gomez. It's my pleasure to introduce him as the final speaker of the conference. And Dr. Jose Diaz Gomez is a staff cardiac anesthesiologist and intensive care physician at the Baylor College of Medicine in Houston. Dr. Diaz Gomez has trained extensively in both anesthesia and critical care medicine across multiple sites in both Colombia and the United States, including residency at the Cleveland Clinic, where he went on to serve as both cardiac thoracic anesthesiologist and intensivist, as well as assistant professor of anesthesiology. He has subsequently worked at other prestigious institutions, such as the Mayo Clinic in Jacksonville and the Baylor College of Medicine in Houston. He is currently obtaining a master's in applied science in patient safety and healthcare quality at John Hopkins Bloomberg a Public Health, School of Public Health. Dr. Jose Diaz Gomez. Thank you. Um, may I share my screen? Is that okay, Dr. Perez? Yes, Jose. Yes, you can share your screen. Yes, sir. Thank you. I want to thank uh, the uh, committee uh, for this invite and especially my dear colleague and friend, Dr. Paulo Perez de Ampar. Um, I really want to show you what I consider is the um, highest point of contribution to utilize point of care ultrasonography in extracorporeal life support. And um, I take this from one of my favorite books, this graphic where I always making sure whatever I'm doing, there is a reason why I'm doing so. So the way I have put this outline, I will tell you what is POCUS, what is ECLS, when we are doing that and why we do it. So there is a disclaimer and everybody knows here that when we are doing ECLS, uh, patient selection will be essential on that. And we have uh, kind of optimized our ECMO flows and doing bent strategies based on echocardiography. I work in a cardiothoracic ICU every day. So probably that's different when you work in another setting that is not that so specialized. And ultimately, I really care about those long-term outcomes, especially as I need to provide some bridge to recovery or actually uh, transplantation to those patients who have such a catastrophic event. So what is a uh, point of care ultrasonography? I will give you 10 seconds to read the definition that we put together back in 2021. What is that important? Because these definitions empower us that we are not cardiologists or radiologists. That doesn't mean to be divisive at all. And it, it gives us the opportunity to go um, and collaborate with those colleagues. So those colleagues know what we are using this for. And what really the cardiologists have loved about this definition is that immediate clinical integration. Beyond that, you can, you can plug this a definition in whether you're doing critical care echo, whether you're doing uh, an assessment as a hospitalist. So this will be at the bedside utilization of ultrasonography in ECLS, okay? What is the future for POCUS? Well, I have some news for you. Without going into details, the handheld ultrasound system will be more available. There will be less buttons. The, the images will be faster and will have artificial intelligence. So the, 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 future of focus is extremely bright. However, we still have some issues and you can see in this paper how uh, there are other societies or other colleagues continue complaining that uh, apparently we haven't paid that much attention about training and experience. And that's probably the reason I'm bringing this definition as a very good first step. I'm assuming that everybody who's coming to this course at least have the skills to utilize the tool in the right manner. And however, they, and you see here in the right, they are acknowledging that um, pretty much we intensivists or critical care specialists are probably the ones who can do better focus. And I, 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 I can take that as a good sign that we have evolved in this collaboration with our cardiology colleagues. 
definitely is a, is a very good point. Uh, it's a very, very uh, specific moment for us in collaboration with cardiologists. Okay, so what is ECLS? You can see the definition there. And pretty much we, we try to uh, really do this in selected patients who present cardiac arrest. And right now my center is close to 200, uh, you know, ECMOs this year. Uh, so we have a significant volume and that's the reason I accepted this invite by Dr. Perez de Empire. Okay, when we do it, uh, based on uh, the data that is available, shock rhythm, and pretty much we are able to do this in less than an hour after starting CPR. It's better if the patient has a higher uh, pH and, and, and lower lactic acid. Those are good, good, good things to deploy this. I need to take this paper that is actually coming out of Europe when in Germany. You can see now there are two things here coming to your mind. You are seeing they are doing, they're providing ECLS. They are doing ECMO. They did this for 254 patients. But guess what? Beside the fluoroscopy, they put ultrasound. And you will remind this in the end of the presentation. Let's go to the why, which is the core of the presentation. Number one, it's good to characterize what is the theology of the cardiac arrest. Number two, uh, we'll try to see where the cannulas are. Three, how we'll start that support. And then we can face some complications. And in this case, uh, this courtesy of one of my colleagues, Dr. Powell here. And yeah, we are trying to see how well we are doing the compressions. Okay. And then um, this is something I have developed uh, over the years that um, there are protocols that give you during the pulse check to, um, to see what will be the, uh, the theology. But in fact, you, you can do even. Uh, even just uh, even uh, leaving your pro in place, and you can see how uh, you can probably rule out some of the pathologies. So this is this is important. Okay, this one was not running. You can see even during compressions, I'm able to. I have developed that skill, and I'm not saying that in a in a way different. That as you're able to refine how you do this with your teams, I just trying to make a parallel with what you can do even with T or TT, I don't have any distinction. I don't have any bias. I should be capable to do both both techniques depending on the patient, depending on the situation. I can challenge you um, in those cases where we have uh, probably a couple of hundreds of sophagectomies a year, you cannot put a T pro. So it is your responsibility to really become proficient in both techniques. So in this case, uh, for example, um, we are trying to really characterize a diagnosis here, and this is so meaningful just to, to see how you are facing now. Okay, you can address this uh, pathology. Uh, in, the, in this case, how this patient has have P uh, and it's, it has underfilled, and you have better characterization what you're doing here. Say that's this that patient, and this is a transesophageal view. I can see very typical saddle P. How can you rescue a patient after a cardiac arrest without having this image? In this case, sometimes we get surprised. Look at this was one of my uh, recent cardiac arrests and then the patient had a, actually a type A dissection. So then we go, we start doing um, cannulations and of course the surgeons or the interventional cardiologists or another intensivist can need guidance uh, regarding the position of these wires in this midst of a real view. As you can see that, um, and then um, you complement with the by cable view and trying to see how you do your, a wire advancement as you put in the venous cannula, you then deploy your cannula and noise in the right position. Um, and then this is important as well. And you have to uh, really make sure whenever your wires are the venous and the arterial where they are landing. And I'm showing you here how after a femoral arterial uh, cannulation, I can see my wire is sending aorta. Then uh, we, we start, we now initiate, uh, let's say, the, the VA ECMO. And after uh, doing that, we, we try to see what is the response. And then we start to see a new finding here, for example. Now you you have you have a new issue and it happens and then we are able to diagnose that actually that patient now is, is having 
uh, and a regional tampon are there. So this is very, very important as an initial complication. Okay, um, sometimes we get called to the bedside and we need to reassess uh, flows and it's important to see whether or not what is expected. Like in this case, we have uh, the ability to really use color flow Doppler and evaluate the flows. Um, or sometimes we need to make a call and say, you know what, uh, we probably were trying to decompress this, this ventricle, but, it, but it's too much. And then um, because of that, uh, we can readjust the management. In this case, for example, and we have this uh, right ventricular dysfunction, if you know, and you have that, then you can really readjust your, your therapy. So it's a real uh, way to personalize management after um, you know, ECLS. Then um, sometimes we are in a very bad shape. And uh, then when you have this kind of minimal flows, and this is a really bad complication, and able to have a better um, discussion with our surgeons and determine futility. And I, I, so I, you can see the why at the why spectrum of what this kind of imaging brings to the table. Um, of course, it's not only for for um, VA ECMO was primarily, that was the main indication, but uh, sometimes we would need to put a um, um, balloon pump and some of our surgeons believe there's a good way to combine with the uh, VA ECMO or even um, right now, we are really trying to determine the best way to do so. But once again, you can see here the application when uh, utilizing um, interactive balloon pump in patients with VA ECMO and even using a uh, three-dimensional echocardiography to ensure that it's in the right uh, position. So this has been a, a real explosion over the last two years in our institution and um, the utilization of uh, impella support is going really, really, really high. So um, for any um, new hypertension, any alarms, they know that uh, definitively we'll do echocardiography assessment. So once again, uh, this standstill image here allows us to basically to have the measurement and thus direct communication. And we have even the uh, capability to um, you know, communicate with our uh, interventional calories that are not here, they're at home. And this is the way you can really excel in that regard. So, but but why why then does has the role? I have shown you what, when, and partially the why. But there are three questions that should come to your mind right now. Number one is that can I provide safer care when I'm cannulating vessels, especially in these emergency situations? How can I make sure I tell whoever is doing it, or even myself, that the cannulation was appropriate? How can I make it faster? You cannot spend half an hour just kind of reading a picture. Okay, it's an easy LS. So there are the evidence is as follows: uh, improving the cannulation time, just being partners on the cannulation time. You can see here um, how when you do with focus, 20 minutes, fluoroscopy, 15 minutes, and landmark, 22 minutes. So, okay, is that the real answer? That has to be focusing the time. However, however, when you're seeing the misplacement of cannulas, then we can problem because you can see here, neither in the pockets or in the fluoroscopy group, there were any misplacements in the cannula. But here you have three. And I will tell you, so oh, only three, Jose. Let me ask you this. What if that any of those three patients are even a, a friend of yours. We should really maximize patient safety in 2023. We have the tools which need to be better, better organized and apply those tools better. And that's the central message regarding this application. So it appears, and again, even not in my own institution, and I, I will be happy to take that question and interact with my colleagues from Toronto, but 
the vast majority of institutions in the world cannot achieve the combination of both modalities. So my dream is to have both ultrasonography and fluoroscopy. And I know there are some advancements regarding having a more portable fluoroscopy units, but to me, to do this at the point of care, we really need both. We need both. And uh, any intensity should be uh, in capacity to manage a linear probe, do transthoracic, do transesophageal, and do fluoroscopy if they really want the safest care for these patients. So you can see in this study when they were using fluoroscopy guided cannulation and ultrasound guided cannulation, you can see here the complications, okay? The complications, wow. There was a difference there. And you can see when in my institution, uh, interventional cardiology is doing the ECLS, most of the time they try us to put the patient in the cath lab, but what if the patient is crashing in the ICU? Try to, we try to bring the fluoroscopy, but for, for the most part, I'm the one providing basically ultrasound guidance, including PE. So what we have, so what we have is the following, is that ultrasound guidance, you start with the linear probe, and then after that, transesophageal, and then we try to really uh, make sure that we don't have issues with the limbs. And that's probably the very first really early complication that triggers a lot of back problems. I want you to take a look for 10 seconds, this KUB. This is a previous case that I had. I want you to pay attention here. In this case, only afterwards, only when we're doing um, winning of the ECMO, we discovered that the patient was not in VA ECMO and it was a cardiac arrest. The patient actually had venous because this arterial cannula went from the artery was crossed and then pierced the vein again. So actually this patient was on being a venous step of time. So things happen. So once again, this case has made me so humble that we really need to be a, the best efforts to provide both fluoroscopy and echocardiography. So what we have so far, cardiac arrest, mino, mino number 10, I have very clear the patient selection. I should have in mind fluoroscopy and my point of care ultrasonography. And then basically, this is the this is the, the goal to provide the ECMO. We can try to see how energy ability to go to the cath lab because we need to reperfuse. And then here, we know what to do with echocardiography, optimizing the ECMO flows, and then um, making sure that the valve, uh, aortic valve is opening, preventing LV distension, and even considering eventing modality. That's what we do. Last thing I we're going to share with you a case uh, happens to me earlier this year. He's an old, old, I mean, a 44-year-old patient. He had a lung transplant. She arrested. I took over. It was the evening. Wow. Oh, Jose, this patient has, you know, their low flow alarms. So that was the, this is, these are the legs. And basically, and she has access, you know, both, both groins. I'm like, wow, okay. So I, I was trying to see what was going on. This was, uh, if you can see, I'm not gonna say the, the brand, but this is a handheld ultrasound system. No, not a big, it's a portable one. Again, this is my personal one. That's the way I do it here. So I noticed that, okay, well, you know, I can see that this is working. Uh, somehow I have the color flow doper. I'm probably suspecting that, well, the volume wise is low and it's starting to see here some fluid. So I continue doing it. Uh, that's because I was there. Uh, this was a portal, uh, portal vein assessment, which is more consistent probably with volume started being on the lower side. And I continue doing my point of care ultrasonography. Now I am seeing actually uh, free fluid in the abdomen. And I, I, I didn't like it. I, I really didn't like it. So I continue scanning and there is free fluid in the abdomen. The patient has cardiac arrest and then they put a VA ECMO. What I go from here? So, okay. So basically, I call a, a vascular surgeon and I say, hey, listen, I call a, a acute care surgery 
let's say, listen, I have this situation, it's fluid, it, it might be it might be blood. Can you help me out? So, okay, well, sure, Jose. So I completed that with, this is the, the assessment of the heart, you can see, you know, the aortic valve is open, nothing like out of proportion. And then you can see even the short axis beam. And you can see the quality. This patient was almost 310 uh, pounds. So uh, here we have the apical view. Okay, I brought them. So basically, I did a synthesis. I was telling them, okay, if blood is coming out, it's not temporary anymore, you have to help. So now I have, you can see it here, 1.5 liters of blood. I put a big tail, boom. Okay, we went to the OR. You can see here the ECMO, all this blood coming out. Now you have open abdomen, they remove my, my drain. You know what happened? With the CPR, there was abrasions of the capsule of the liver and that was causing the hemoperitoneum. It's the first time I'm facing that in my life. And once again, it's humbling, but I wouldn't have the hand, handheld ultrasound system to have another complication, I wouldn't be able to catch that. And only the first sign was low flows in the ECMO because they increase uh, intradominal pressure. When I was able to, to drain that one and a half liters, the patient gained flows right away with the ECMO. So in conclusion, the highest point of uh, Falco's contribution in ECLS is achieved when we are able to recognize what ECLS is and we apply apply it alongside Focus at the right time at the candidacy. And uh, Focus seems to facilitate safer, more reliable, and timely cannulation in ECLS, especially when it's combined with fluoroscopy. With that, um, I want to thank you here from Houston. I don't call today, but it has been a pleasure uh, joining this prestigious panel you have put together. Thank you to Paris Empire for being invited again. Okay, thank you so much. So um, I have the honor now of opening up the Q&A session. So unfortunately, a few of our presenters, including Dr. Wiskar, Dr. Uh, Nick Ravan, and Dr. Turan are unavailable to answer questions just due to unforeseen circumstances. So um, luckily we have Pablo here and, and Jose, but uh, Dr. Dano has also agreed to help answer some questions, especially regarding Vexus uh, for with which he is familiar. So um, just going to the Q&A uh, to start, we have some questions. Um, so Julian asks, uh, what is the physiological explanation of hepatic S reversal uh, without any TR uh, on the, on the uh, VEXUS score? And uh, Dr. Dono, would you be able to uh, pr provide some insights into this? Yes, for sure. So, um, so, so, so the question regarding uh, why S is reversed when you have tricuspid regurgitation is that it? Yeah. No, I think it's in the patient without tricuspid regurgitation. Why yeah. does the okay. Yes. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah. so what happened is that the S wave is really during systole. So, typically, what will happen during systole is normally you have the motion of your tricuspid annulus that squeeze toward the apex, okay? And that creates the, the systolic flow from the hepatic vein to the right atrium. So when you have RV dysfunction, even without any tricuspid regurgitation, what will happen is that there's gonna be no motion of the tricuspid annulus, okay? But then during systole, what can happen is that the, the tricuspid valve might bump this way, okay? And this motion, will create the reversal of the S wave that you can see in the hepatic vein, even if you don't have any uh, tricuspid regurgitation. In addition, what you'll see also in your CVP waveform will be a big V wave also. That's the other the element that will be complementary with this uh, with this, uh, with this element. So actually, Dr. Dron, I just have a question regarding the use of excess in an ICU population. A lot of the studies that were discussed talked about using it longitudinally during an ICU stay, starting from post-operative day one or immediately after the operation. Now, can you use it longitudinally before and after extubation or before and after the initiation or the discontinuation of positive pressure ventilation? And then in an extubated spontaneous ventilating patient, would you be able to, to correlate the before and afters or not really? That's a, that's a good question. The, the studies that we did, it were mostly by William Bobby and who was a nephrologist who presented yesterday. 
Uh, the way we did it, we just did one measurement, you know, every day mm -hmm. for three to four days. And that's really how we, we got our experience. And, and I would typically do it, you know, more uh, in a more longitudinal fashion, not necessarily acutely, because if ever, and you can, you can, you can look at this, if ever you take a patient, for instance, and you give him a, a fluid bolus very, very fast, okay, you'll see instantaneously a portal possibility. And we see this even when you give it to normal people, because you're, what's happening is that you're raising suddenly the right atrial pressure. And all the vexus issue is basically transmission of the right atrial pressure in the periphery, which should not be transmitted in the periphery. So anything which will increase suddenly your right atrial pressure will increase uh, the possibility. We just completed a study in which we look at um, an element which eventually might come into the vexus score, which is the femoral venous Doppler. Okay, And the femoral venous Doppler should be uh, continuous, like the portal vein. So what we found is that if you do it just before and after the intubation, okay, so what we found is that at baseline, about 20% of patients have, po have positivity, you know, before cardiac surgery, but after intubation, that goes up to 50%, okay? Mm -hmm. And that's probably because you're increasing the right atrial pressure with positive pressure ventilation. On the other hand, what we observe, and that's why every patient is different, is that we had a cer certain number of patients in which the positivity was present before the intubation and resolved after the intubation. Those were patients with mitral regurgitation or aortic regurgitation. And you know that with induction of anesthesia, you create vasodilatation. So the benefit of the vasodilatation in those patients was greater than the effect of positive ventilation on the right heart. And that's why in those patients, we saw normalization. So these, these values can change rapidly. And, and then, uh, and then the, the significance of these rapid change, I'm not sure the meaning of this, but when the, the, the signals is constant and when you see it changing over the, the days, and in fact, what we observe is the peak change after cardiac surgery was on the second day. And it's often on the second day when you mobilize your fluid, you go in pulmonary edema, your creatinine goes up, your lactate goes up. And that's really on the second day that we observe this. And this is really when you really, if you see this, that's really when you don't give fluid. You know, we remove fluid in those patients. So that, that's, that's been a kind of our experience with the VEXA score in our institution. Thank you. Thank you so much. So... Pablo, I'm going to ask you to, to comment on lung ultrasound. I know you perform quite a few, you know, POCA studies being such a, a kind of aficionado yourself. And um, the question that comes uh, regarding lung ultrasound is, can you comment on adding color Doppler on lung with consolidation for optimizing the diagnosis of pneumonia? Um, yeah, so for the for diagnosis of pneumonia, one of the things you want to look for in lung ultrasound is the uh, dynamic bronchogram that um, um, Sarah showed a couple of slides where you feel like 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 bubble popping up, uh, where you can if you if you will uh, add uh, color to it, it would be, uh, you you could also see that uh, changes in, in different directions of the flow, but uh, to my knowledge, it doesn't. Uh, really offer an accurate advantage in terms of uh, diagnosis uh, for pneumonia itself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I agree with that. Uh, I don't tend to use the color Doppler in order to add any kind of diagnostic utility. Dr. Deneau, do you have any any insights? I will have a, one of my colleagues who uh, was um, doing a study uh, looking at pneumonia and uh, looking at uh, Doppler tissue, the Doppler in the in the vessels. His hypothesis is that when you have a severe pneumonia, you're gonna have a shunt, okay? And, uh, uh, but if you have a consolidation where uh, you don't have uh, so much hypoxia, that means that you have a vasoconstriction, you know, hypoxic vasoconstriction. So his hypothesis was that maybe the velocity would be different, you know, if you have a, a true uh, consolidation with pneumonia in which you would have a shunt versus a consolidation in which you have preserved uh, hypoxic vasoconstriction. So, uh, but I think he's still under the recruitment uh, phase, so I cannot tell you more. But the, oh, the idea is 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 uh, is also um, uh, based on this uh, on this uh, concept. 
Uh, people also in, in pulmonary embolism, in, in peripheral pulmonary embolism, people also use uh, color Doppler to see there's no flow in that in that region. But uh, I personally don't have much experience uh, using color Doppler in, in those situations. And uh, Dr. Jose Diaz Gomez, do you have any uh, insights or any uh, additional considerations? I know you were uh, advocating or trumpeting the uh, the utility and the need to be able to be very comfortable and and facile with both point of care ultrasound using handheld modalities as well as TEE fluoroscopy. These different modalities. Do you use color Doppler specifically when when helping uh, increase the diagnostic sensitivity? Yeah, let me let me let me take one step back, and I think. Uh, Something I really need to advocate for is that do not forget your primary uh, role as a clinician. I will tell you, I'm not aware of anyone discontinuing antibiotics or not giving empiric antibiotics on somebody who has a clinical suspicion based on the ultrasound imaging. Mm -hmm. What I'm trying to say is that uh, the value of using color flow or, color, uh, or power Doppler I don't think you have enough evidence to say that would really should influence your clinical decision making. If a patient has clinical suspicion of pneumonia, you should treat it. And it's the same in parallel if you will have a CT scan or you have a chest radiograph. But I will be opposed to try to put an ultrasound modality over the clinical picture, especially with the patient population I deal with that are transplant patients, you know, immunosuppressed patients. I, I cannot apply that. And I've been always challenged by very reputable cardiologists or pulmonologists. Jose, are you taking that decision on image? So we are not an imaging specialist. We're primarily clinicians using a powerful tool that have diagnostic capability. So another question regarding Vexis, um, Dr. Dono, I'll direct this towards you. And do you see any additional value of doing renal Doppler on top of portal vein Doppler interrogation in Vexis? Um, that's a good question. The, um, uh, the, uh, the portal vein is much easier to get. You know, the success rate in our experience is more than 95, 90, 98%. In fact, the, the situation where you don't get it it's often very obese patient where you have a, a very steatosis, very bright liver. And in those patients, what you can do is can you, you can just look at the spleen and look at the splenic vessels, which will give you also the same similar formation. Uh, but I think to, um, uh, in the, um, uh, if you have significant uh, portal positivity, uh, it's rare that the kidney will be completely normal unless it's a false positive. Okay, and, and this can also, this is also part of the, the limitations. Uh, but I think the whole idea is when you look at the venous system is try to have as much as possible evidence that there's general venous congestion everywhere. And if you have a good signal on the kidney, I think that's additional evidence mm -hmm. that uh, this kidney is congested and, and definitely will not improve with more fluid. Okay, mm -hmm. so that's, I would say, that's the, the, the advantage, it supports your finding. And, and the idea of the VEXA score, which was developed at the Heart Institute uh, by Dr. Sulini, uh, originally validated, is, is to try to, to take more than one elements. And if you take more than one elements, the probability uh, of, a, of a response or the association with, uh, with the outcome was much better than if you just take one uh, on, on his own. So um, I think, uh, I think it's a, it's a good uh, it's good habit to uh, to have a quick look and, and to see those uh, all those elements, put them together, and take a decision. And, and I agree with uh, Dr. Diaz Gomez. Don't treat a patient, you know. Don't treat an ultrasound image. We treat patients, okay? and we try to put this together. And also, when you do the vexus, we're, I'm lucky. I do cardiac anesthesia all the time, and, and I can correlate it with the CVP waveform. With the right ventricular uh, waveform also, so I know that it's it's all related uh, to RV dysfunction, and uh, and then you you can take the, a better decision regarding how you manage uh, the patient, particularly in terms of fluid management. I think what we all kind of advocate for is the use of ultrasound as another point of data for triangulation, as opposed to you know sole reliance. And I think uh, yeah. the more familiar and the more comfortable you are integrating these various imaging modalities or diagnostic modalities, the probably closer you come to the truth 
uh, in all of these various uh, diagnostic dilemmas that we come up with. So Pablo, I'm going to ask you because I know you're very experienced and uh, you you lecture a lot on use of transesophageal echo during resuscitation, acute CPR and arrest situations. And uh, do you think there's any concern for esophageal perforation when you have uh, a, t a transesophageal echo in during active CPR? That's a great question. Um, sorry, just uh, Dr. Torano was trying to connect, but his Wi-Fi is not helping. So I'll, uh, I'll, I'll answer. Uh, yeah, that's a great question. Um, to my knowledge, although it seems like a very um, honest concern, uh, there's no increase in incidence of uh, major complication from TE during chest compressions. And, and the, the complication quoted in the literature, which at this point is still, there's quite a paucity of the literature in, in, the, in, the, in the terms of cardiac arrest and use of TE, there hasn't been shown any increased risk of performing TE during, uh, during chest compression so far. But uh, it's clearly um, a, a potential concern and you just need to keep in mind the um, usual um, um, precautions that you will have in any other patient having uh, a TE and, and, the, and the relative and absolute contraindications and the same in terms of performing an adequate uh, technique for probe insertion to avoid any uh, any uh, any further uh, trauma or injury. So far, uh, most of the injuries or complications have been um, reported as being due to insertion, both in the oropharynx and the uh, oral cavity. So let me ask you, like Pablo, in a, in a hospital kind of wide and spread out as Sunnybrook is, what are the logistics or some of the practicalities of you know getting the arrest call, being able to mobilize a team with a TE, getting the the machine and the probe to the ward where the arrest is occurring, finding out enough information in order to um, recognize whether it's safe or not to proceed with TE and then actually performing the study in, in a way that's um, clinically useful. How does that unfold? Like what are the logistics of that at, at, a, at the hospital where you are? Cause I know you're able to do it with some success there. Yeah. So, so um, that's also a great question. Uh, so we're lucky enough that um, in our emergency department, there's a very strong uh, point of care ultrasound um, team and program. And in fact, uh, they, they're they the one to perform the uh, intra-arrest PE. If there's a, uh, a cardiac arrest in the emergency department, they have the capability in terms of equipment and personnel uh, to to perform the resuscitative PE and get the information from that. Uh, in the operating room, uh, since obviously we're a cardiac center, there's always a uh, cardiac within uh, normal hours. But um, other than that, we have been training and we have trained now a few uh, small group of non-cardiac anesthesiologists and at least being able to obtain the resuscitative four or five views mm -hmm. in the context of a cardiac arrest. And in fact, not only using the the full cardiac OR T machines, but a couple of our uh, focus machines, like the portable ones, they also have E probes that can be used for, and we can save those images. And the same applies for the ICU. A couple of years ago, we started training a, um, a couple of our intensivists, like a non non anesthesiologist uh, intensivist, uh, and also resuscitative T. So logistically, they also have the machine and the capabilities of doing the study in the ICUs. Out of the ICUs, out of the OR and emergencies, it's, it's not it's not feasible, not possible so far. And like doing an award, it's not it's not feasible at this point. So maybe we'll get at we'll get there at some point. Um, but the idea is to like build that collaboration between those three departments, the ICU, the um, the uh, emergency department and the um, and the OR uh, to have the capabilities of the first uh, help each other collaborate to each other. And now, in fact, we share the archive system. We share it among the three uh, departments. Uh, so we can all upload our, our scans studies that so we can uh, all share and, and look at all, each other's studies and, and, and work as a QA process in terms of that. So you feel it's most, most of the utility is in the emergency department and the ICU as opposed to general medicine. And, and, and in the operating room, yes. Yes, yeah, so far, yes. Yes, like, uh, like I don't think we'll get to the point. Like even 
doing a trans thoracic in the ward is still um, still not easy, okay? Because unless um, it's mostly because of training, uh, unless you have somebody who's always available to perform a quick uh, point of care ultrasound in the context of a cardiac arrest, it's gonna it's just challenging to have it at every single cardiac arrest that happens in the hospital outside of the perioperative areas or the ICUs or the emergency department. Fantastic. Okay, so that's all of our questions, and that brings our Q and A to a close. Thank you for all all your involvement and in, in Dr. Dono for adding his expertise last minute. Uh, so thank you very much, uh, everyone, for your participation and your attention over the course of the weekend. And now I'll hand over to Annette for awards and uh, closing remarks. <laughs>